Hello, and welcome to the table to Ancient Civilizations of the Inner Sea. So uh, this game just arrived this morning, and uh, I was uh, very much looking forward to this. I, um, I do laugh. Uh, some folks talk about how they don't like uh, when I do Euro or uh, dungeon romping games. And that's my primary background, is Euro and Dungeon Rapid Games. Uh, hence my copy of Lisboa right here. Um, and so uh, I do find it funny, because uh, war games are something that I play on the PC. I have a whole bunch of war games on Steam, you know, I just play on my computer. And um, I'm largely disappointed in war games in board game format. Uh, large, mostly because... Uh, uh, well, there's several reasons. Number one, I, if I play a war game, I'm usually playing solitaire because I don't have friends that play war games with me. So I think if I had friends that played war games with me, I might have a different opinion. But uh, the whole concept of an AI is very new to uh, uh, war gaming. I mean, there's a few games like Ambush that did it many years ago, but it's still a rare thing. I mean, a lot of people talk about playing solitaire and they do it schizophrenic style. You know, and um, uh, nothing wrong with it. It's just it's not what I consider solitaire play. That's just, you know, I want to play all the sides. I mean, I did that with 18 OE uh, when I did my playthrough of that. So, I mean, I showed that I was capable of it as well. Well, my copy of Lisboa is just here because the board was very warped when it arrived. And you can even see it's still bending up a little bit here. Uh, they basically give you two boards. It looks like a really long map, but it's two uh, boards that don't really, you know, because of, because of the warping there, they're not really staying together super well, but this is way better than it was when it first came out of the box. Uh, so as you uh, may have guessed, this game is about, um, this is ancient era uh, warfare. Uh, I was going to open up my video and saying, welcome to the game of Tron, where players must use their discs to pit against each other. I mean, this game, component-wise, literally has uh, two component. well, maybe three. It has discs, and it has cards. <laughs> that concludes the component overview of this game. Um, I guess you could argue it's got a little bit more, because it's got these old uh, coin uh, cylinders, and then it has, uh, this is like uh, for uh, Ancient Wonders. So if I build the Great Lighthouse, you know, you get this nice little cube. Um, the, uh, the components don't comprise of much more than that. Uh, uh, in fact, you've just seen it all. So, uh, obviously, uh, if you're here just to watch the game played, go to video two. Uh, I'm just going to give a quick introduction to the game. And then, uh, I will not, uh, actually start playing this evening. It's actually quite late at night right now. So I'm just going to do this introduction and then upload, and maybe you will see more of this uh, tomorrow. Okay, so uh, what is this game? What is it about? Uh, let me just state that um, my attraction to this game is uh, I like Euros. And I think this is GMT sort of, you know, catering to it. This is a, it's a war game. Don't get me wrong. This is a war game with Euro-y stuff in it. Let's put it that way. Um, it is arguably a quite light game. Uh, I mean, just to put it in perspective, the uh, designer of this did Hitler's Reich, and, uh, that was also considered a light game. Um, not to say that it was easy to win or anything like that, but, but it's a lighter game as far as rules go. This game is definitely a lighter game as far as rules. Within 20 minutes, I was able to read... The rule book from front to end. So let's talk about that real quick. The rule book is very thin. Um, there's not much to it and uh, it is, I don't know, 20 pages and it's really nice. It's a, it's a nice read and it has some nice examples and unlike Hitler's Reich, um, when I read the rule book, every time a question popped into my head, but what about this situation? They covered it. They literally covered it. So this is what Hitler's Reich was supposed to do. Because I really think there's a good game in there somewhere. 
Um, but anyways, um, uh, this, of course, is covering uh, player versus player. This game has up to six players, and so the way it works uh, there is this is two, four, those are your six player colors, okay? Then you have barbarians, and then this is uh, extra. Uh, you use those for talents, and uh, talents are like a, like a sort of like a currency that you get in the game. And, um, and then, of course, this is your wonders, and then this is used for things like tracking, you know, things on the board. Um, uh, we can also use it, it's actually very coin-like. Um, <laughs> you can actually put these out, oh, we're resolving this battle here, and then, you know, they call it a competition, and then you uh, resolve the competition, and then it's over. Okay, so uh, a couple of things. Uh, the... Um, the game, I mean, when I was telling you it was a 20 page and I was able to get through it in 20 minutes, um, it's literally because on page six, this is your setup for a two player game. And you can see uh, they use the white discs as a uh, way to, like you place these white discs on the map and it's almost like um, when you're in a swimming pool and you know, and little kids aren't allowed to go to the deep end. Uh, that's what this looks like. And so this is, this is the shallow end where the little kids are allowed to play. And then this is the deep end. They're not allowed to go over there. Um, mm. So the whole game is played, even though we have this big map, the whole game is played just on that map. Okay, and so in a two-player, this is, this is what they call the basic setup. And bear with me here, because uh, this game has basic setup, and then it has a, um, a playbook, which is like twice, maybe three times as thick as the rule book. And the reason is, is there's... Um, uh, this playbook does have like a step-by-step -step playthrough of a sample game, just like most GMT playbooks do. Uh, it has a solitaire uh, section that starts on page 20, and it's probably maybe four or five pages long. So uh, this is obviously extremely important because we have to understand how the solitaire play works. Um, but uh, I'm going to put the camera down real quick. The, the game also has... Uh, scenarios uh, throughout and so you got like this one's Caesar versus Pompey it's a two civilization scenario and so this is going to be different than the basic scenario so like I'm showing you here on the regular rule book this is a basic play setup and this is Egypt and I believe Troy okay so it's just really um, it's considered basic play nothing uh, fancy but these scenarios actually have special rules that change the rules of the game so it's very much like 18OE. If you ever played the scenarios in those, I know I'm referencing an 18XX game in comparison to this, but um, so right here is the... Uh, so for example, there's Antony and Cleopatra. It's two civilizations. It tells you you use the full map. So you might be thinking, well, if I'm playing just a two-player game, I want to use the full map. Well, right there it is. So you're going to play Antony and Cleopatra, full map. One player is Rome, the other is Egypt. Everybody begins with 20 discs. So you see it's like a completely different... I mean, the scenario is going to follow the same rules as the basic game, but the setup is different. The allowable territories is different. Everything is different. And, and then sometimes it may even have special rules that like where they change the actual rules of the game. I, I've never played these scenarios yet, so I can't tell you or, or show you an example real quick. But like, um, And then it has like even solitaire adjustments. So if I want to play this as a solitaire game... Here's what I do, and it's uh, it's highlighted in yellow, so you can ignore it if you're playing a multiplayer game, or you can focus on it if you're playing a solitaire game. And it has time limit, like this particular one has a time limit, etc., etc. So I, I wanted to point this out because there's a whole bunch of them before page 20. Then you get to page 20 where it actually explains how solitaire works. And and the reason I say that is because those scenarios up until page 20. They're really multiplayer scenarios that they very kindly gave you, you know, hey, if you wanted to play these solitaire, this is what you do. And then, of course, the solitaire rules are here, but let me keep going. And, for example, right here you can see this is the Fall of Rome 2 scenario, and it is a solitaire scenario. So this scenario is dedicated specifically to solitaire play. And there's even three versions of it. There's you can play Defense of the Empire, Western Rome versus the Visigoths, Eastern Rome versus the Persians. Um, you pick. 
Uh, see right here, choose one of the following. So even though this is one scenario, there's actually three scenarios in it. Um, and then as far as the setup goes, you can see here there's the, the purple side, which I think is Rome, and then the red is Eastern Rome, and, and then there's some uh, discs for uh, the Goths. And then the gold, uh, believe it or not, is used in this scenario. Um, those are like critical plate, like critical VP places. So, so the AI is really trying to get those gold, conquer those gold areas. So that's like their, pri excuse me, it's used for priority. Um, I'm not saying that that's the way every scenario is, but that's the way this one is. And then um, if you keep going, um, and then this is really cool. And, and GMT does a lot of this, and I really appreciate it. Uh, they're actually showing this is what the world looked like when the Roman Empire fell. You know, it's, it's a, it wasn't necessary, but it's pretty nice that they added it. And, um, and then they have like a lot of like, uh, like this here is uh, rules, but then they try to justify it thematically. Like thematically, this is what it was like when you had terror tactics and shock, because the Huns are in, in this game. Um, actually, I actually think this is a different scenario. Let me, let me go back. Um, this might not be the Rome scenario, or is it? It is the Rome scenario, so sorry, my apologies. This is the, and then they have the Visigoths, so they're going to have, this is rules just for that Roman scenario we just looked at. This has nothing to do with regular solitaire play of like a basic game. It has nothing to do, so I, I'm trying to like really impress upon you that this is like many games in one. So if I show you like a basic game and this is how the AI works there, this is AI rules just for the Visigoths in this scenario. It's not the AI rules for some other scenario or for the basic game. I hope I'm making sense. Um, now, how much different is it? I, I can't tell you, I, I haven't played this. And then you can see here, now we get to Greeks and Persians. And so then they have it set up and you can see there's the, there's the swimming pool line again. So this is a more compressed map. It's a smaller, you know, scenario. Um, so it doesn't have, uh, as you can see, there's not a version one, two, or three on this, but you play as the Greeks, it tells you, and then the Persians are the NPC, and then it's telling you what to do. Um, so these are like, these are in the regular rules, but these are like modifications to the regular rules and, um, and so forth. And then, you know, what happens if civilizations are eliminated, Persian cohabitation, <laughs> Like, these are all modifications to the regular rules. So you would have to study this just to get a grasp on what to do in that scenario. And it keeps going. This is Alexander the Great. Um, the, the rule book explained that this one is a aggressive one, where the other two, you're more a defensive player. This one, you are the attacker. And so you have to conquer the territory, and they give you a time limit to do it. Um, so then you can see, these are all rules to the scenario. Um, none of these rules are base game rules. Uh, here is Darius the third, and you can see, um, you know, it's again, a smaller map area. And, um, and so now you're playing, this has barbarians in it and Greece. And of course you play as the Persians and there's even, you know, two player variant. So if you had a multiplayer situation, um, I'm not done. I mean, it just keeps going. I mean, it just has scenario after scenario like this. There's the God King of Egypt, and you can see that's a solitaire scenario. And then you keep going. And so here you can see uh, more modifications to the rules. Obviously, there's a multiplayer. I mean, you can clearly tell that the designers wanted to please everybody. Uh, first of all, the, the solitaire games, uh, there's the base game, and then there's these solitaire scenarios. And you can see that they didn't just give us four. I mean, I'm on like, what, the sixth one now? And uh, I'm still going. Um, actually, I think I might be done. Yeah, I'm done. So uh, I think there were six solitaire. But then there was like six multiplayer ones. And then for every multiplayer one, they had, hey, if you wanted to play these solitaire, this is what you do. And then for every one of the solitaire ones, they were like, hey, if you want to play it multiplayer, here's what you do. So um, they like, they gave you everything. 
Now, how much variation is there from one to the next to the next? Uh, I've not played any of this, folks, so I can't tell you. I don't have that expertise to tell you, um, you know, oh, this is the scenario I recommend. Um, I, can, I can tell you that, like, for example, if you think it's too easy or hard, they have suggestions to change um, that. Uh, this is, of course, the t classic GMT playthrough here where you're actually going through an example of play. Um, they recommend that if we're going to do a scenario, they recommend the Roman one first. So the Fall of Rome 2 is the one they recommend that we start with if we're going to do a scenario. But there's no reason we can't just go to a basic game and start there. And I also wanted to show you, so remember this was a 20 page rule book and I told you I was able to get through it in 20 minutes, so what's going on? Well, if you look at this, this is the two player setup. And that took two pages, right? That's two pages. Well, here's two more pages for the three-player setup, two more pages for the four-player setup, two more pages for the five-player setup, and then two more pages for the six-player setup. <laughs> so that was what, two, three, four, five? I mean, that's like 10 pages of the 20-page book. You could just skip through all that because until you're setting up the game, you're not, you're not doing any of that. So if I wanted to play a basic six-player game with you know, me controlling, let's say, one empire, and then there's five NPCs, um, I could do this. I can just set it up per these rules, and then I would read the solitaire section, and I should be able to go up and running. Or I can do these historical scenarios that I was just showing you, which require you to know how to play the base game, and then what they do is they give you like the modifications to the base game rules, so that way you can play those scenarios. So my honest um, opinion right now is I have to do a base game first. If I get into a scenario, I'm adding like extra layers of complexity. Now, here's what my concern is. I think the basic game might be too basic. Like the NPCs just do crazy things. And, and remember, I didn't like Crusader Kings for that reason. Uh, when I did the video playthrough for Crusader Kings, it was an awful game. And it was because the NPCs were just, you know, had no uh, rhyme or reason to what they were doing. I'm not saying that that's the case here, because I've not played this game yet. I'm just telling you, uh, the scenarios seem so attractive to me compared to this. Um, this may have more replayability, because the scenarios seem to be very, you know, specific. Whereas this, I think you have more flexibility, because you can play as all the different countries... Uh, whereas as in a scenario, they prefer that you play as Rome, and it's designed for you to play as Rome. Whereas here, you're, you can play anything you want. Now, uh, as far as components go, I guess there was one more thing. Uh, every civilization has its own card with its own unique abilities and, and stuff, which I didn't bother studying. But that's also something as well. So there might be like some particular civilization here that suits your play style more than anything else. And, you know... This basic game is going to satisfy you. Now, what's funny is, for example, um, you can see here, like, see where it says, here, I'll show you on the board, actually. Carthage starts here. Rome is there. Gaul is up there. Celt Iberia is over here. Uh, you can see Phoenicia, you know, there, and so forth. Um, this six-player game, for example, doesn't have Celt Iberia. Um, it doesn't have Phoenicia. In fact, the players are starting in different places. So uh, we can we can look to see, you know, like what, you know, can I be somebody else or maybe not? And then maybe you have to go to a five-player scenario to be able to play as one of those other players. I don't know. That's the part I'm I'm still. Uh, reading about and that's part of the reason why we're not playing this game tonight is I'm still reading So what I've done is I've read the player versus player and Now I'm moving to the solitaire like how would I play the solitaire part of this? Um, so uh, I have one other concern with this game. I don't know if it's gonna Be a concern that will reach fruition this game is a lot about all right. I'm taking a whole bunch of discs and just placing them on the board, you know, like that. It's going to be a little bit more organized than that, but it's bad. I'm going to take, you know, discs and do something like this, and 
I'm not piling them on top of each other because I think that's hard for a camera to, to see. So I'll, I'll put them like this so you can see better. This is a city that's a settlement. Um, I'm not sure I can put two in a shallow zone. I think I can. And then um, that's another settlement and whatnot. All right, so I'm put a bunch on and then we're gonna play cards that like destroy half of them. And then that's what it's gonna look like after the round's over. Um, this game is not much deeper than that. Now, I'm not saying that there's no strategy in this. I'm saying that uh, you're putting discs on and then you're playing cards to destroy discs and then you have what's left. Then it's another round and you're putting discs on and then you're destroying discs and then you have what's left. Um, that's the basic ebb and flow of this game is you're putting on discs, you're taking them off. Now, um, there's victory points, and I think you have to be mindful of victory points. And um, I'm not saying that putting the discs on and taking them off is, is like, uh, what is what is it that I'm trying to say? Um, I'm not saying that this isn't this, there's no strategy in this game. I'm not even trying to say that this game's not fun. What I'm trying to say, I guess, is that if you're looking for a deep game where you have armies that you're marching and they have cavalry versus, it's not here. These discs like represent the strength of your culture, plus the strength of your military, plus like it's a very abstract representation of everything that represents your society. And the only thing that, that matters with the discs is whether there's one, two, or three of them on your thing. Because a one is a camp, which is a non-hostile situation, so other people can have a disc on there too. And there's no nothing harmful about that. But then once I have two of them, that's a settlement, and now I'm the aggressor, and there's gonna be what's called a competition here, or, see, they don't even refer to them as battles. And then, of course, uh, if I have three of them, that's a city, which um, I score victory points for. So obviously, if I'm scoring victory points for them, uh, he may not like that, so he may put four of them on to try to destroy my city. And there's rules, of course, for how do you destroy and resolve these types of competitions. So um, it's a very light game. I, I can't stress that enough. This is a, from a rules perspective, it's a light game. I'm not saying it doesn't have strategy, because checkers is a light game, but if you don't have the right strategy, someone's going to kick your butt in checkers. And, and I think everybody who knows checkers can agree with that, right? There's, there's actually quite a bit of strategy to checkers if you really get serious about it. This is, I'm not saying it's as easy as checkers, but I'm saying it's like that, though. This has a lot of strategy, but it's a very light game. And in terms of concepts, it's putting on discs and taking them off. I mean... I play a lot of Euro games, and so people make fun of Euro games because they're cube pushers, right? All you do is put cubes on and take them off. Now, if you think about coin games at their core, you're putting cubes on and you're taking them off. I mean, that's, that's really at, at its core what a coin game is. It's just that those cubes represent military forces or whatever. Well, this has got a lot of those same kind of concepts. And so you're putting discs on and you're taking them off. So... Um, uh, before I quit for the night and move on, there are um, other elements. So, like, for example, uh, there's there's a player aid here, and we can sort of go through that real quick. There's um, phases to the game. You have a growth phase, a retirement step, an acquisition step, a resettlement step, a deployment step. And then you have what's called a card phase, a competition phase, and then a reckoning phase. So... This growth phase is putting cubes or discs on the board. But, at, but before you can put discs on the board, you have to calculate how many discs am I allowed to put on the board. That's what some of these steps are, right? You're, you're calculating how many discs you're allowed to put on the board, and then you're actually putting them on the board, and, and that's how your empire grows, right? Then you have the card phase where we play cards to basically hurt each other. So we can play cards that, okay, I'm going to go destroy half of your discs now. And so you do. I mean, that's what these cards do. They, they completely devastate the board. The cards, like you can play a volcano card and then, you know, or whatever. I mean, the cards are where the action occurs. 
and then you go to a competition phase, which is after the card phase, and this is resolving anything that's left. So we've played our cards, but we still have areas where there's still, you know, contention. And so then you do a competition phase to resolve that contention. And by the time the competition phase ends, there is not a single place on the board where there is more than one disc for opposing players. So uh, everything is resolved. And eventually discs get removed until there is a victor. This is Highlander, the board game. Okay. Um, and then you have a reckoning phase because there's things like stacking limits in this game. Uh, so you can only have so many discs on a particular space, but you're allowed to like completely break those rules throughout most of these phases. But then when you get to the reckoning phase, you gotta you gotta sort all that out and balance it back. And then you know you do all that, and then you check to see if the epoch ended or epoch. I don't know what term you're supposed to use. Um, and then uh, if it ends, then you calculate victory points and other nonsense, and then you just rinse and repeat. So that's the idea yeah. for this game. Uh, and like I said, I mean, there's a lot of steps to this procedurally, but this is not as bad as you think. And in fact, these procedural steps, I mean, right here, you can see they even have like the rules re-explained, which is really nice. It, this is a nice player aid. And then on the back, it just has, okay, if somebody plays a particular card, it's got like, uh, sort of like extra detail to explain to you what that card does. And yeah, when an ep epic ends, here's the rules for what happens when an epic ends. And so uh, you do it. There's only four epics in the game, and uh, then the game's over. So uh, it's not, uh, like I said, it's not, this isn't going to be Enemy Actions or Dens where we're going through 32 pages of step-by-step -step instructions. And then also uh, uh, for the Solitaire player aid, there's uh, things for the NPCs and what their priorities are. And, uh, and yes, they are going to have a, and here you can see the order of competition and uh, things of that nature. Um, so the NPCs have some extra logic that you have to do. And that's the part I haven't read yet, so that's why we can't play tonight. Um, and then uh, the cards themselves, there's three types of cards. Uh, there are just what you call the regular cards here. And then there's the C cards. Actually, there's four types. Uh, there's regular cards. These are the ones, like I told you, we're playing, and uh, you're basically, you know, causing everybody else to, to be miserable, right? So that's what these are, right? Right there, millennial volcanoes. That's what it's like to speak to a millennial right there. Um, so here, remove a total of four discs from three contiguous areas. Boom! You're just, like, annihilating a, a section of the map. Okay? Um... These, with a C, they're played during the contests, the competitions. So this is, like I said, after these cards are played, then you resolve the remaining battles or competitions, and that's what this is. So you can play this card to win a specific competition somewhere. These, with the I, they're investment cards. So here, I'll read this one. Place this card face up with three discs. So you take your discs and you put them on, and then at the beginning of your draw step, you take one disc off and draw two cards, and you get to keep one uh, and discard the other. Um, actually, you get to draw two cards and discard any card, so you could actually keep the two you drew and discard something else if you wanted. So it's a nice way to manipulate your hand, right? Um, the three discs are on it, and once the third disc runs out, it's discarded, right? So this is just a little, they call those investment cards. And so it's an investment card to get you card draw. And here's another one. Um, actually, they're the exact same thing. This is called Caravan Caravansary and Academy of Science. And they both do the exact... Oh, actually, this one draws three cards. So maybe a little bit better. But they do the same thing. Okay, and so then uh, they do have, like, uh, the... Con like, there's a lot of theme, rich theme in this. But that's a great person. But it plays just like any other card. All your, I mean, the title and the graphics are beautiful and nice, but the text is really what drives it, and uh, the game is driven almost entirely from these cards. Um, by the way, these cards, the cardstock, I don't know, like, you always hear about cardstock on Kickstarter. Whatever these cards are made of, they're amazing. I mean, 
I, I can't gush enough over these cards. They are so, they're like smooth like butter. So like when I do this, oh my gosh, they're just gliding. It's almost like they have like little tiny ball bearings that are perfectly oiled and just gliding over each other. There is no friction amongst these cards. They are smooth, absolutely smooth as butter. Now, they don't shuffle well because obviously they don't have the, uh, the sleeves, right? But they feel like they're sleeved. I mean, that's how good they feel. They feel like they're, it's just very, I mean, just even my fingers, I like rubbing it. I mean, I don't know what these cards are made of, but man, oh man, they're amazing cards. Uh, GMT cards aren't normally this nice, but uh, these are amazing, amazing cards. So um, uh, the last type of card I wanted to show you is an event card. And it says it right here, but when event cards are drawn into your hand, you actually don't get to keep it. Uh, you have to play it immediately, and then something happens. Um, so event cards, you know, cause all kinds of things, I'm assuming good or bad, um, to happen in the game. So, uh, then the wonders, you can build a wonder and they do things. And, you know, there's, there's text that, you know, some of these are like you put five discs on and then they're giving you, you know, during the acquisition phase, you, you remove a disc. So like this wonder gives you abilities for a certain amount of time. So they're all like uh, game-changing things that you can do. And of course the wonder uh, goes on the map and, uh, and then of course you're gonna have to defend that location because if you ever lose it, the wonder can get raised to the ground and things of that nature. So um, I think that's a, a decent enough uh, explanation of the game. Uh, so one of the things I'm contemplating is if we're gonna do a playthrough I'm being honest with you, I've never played this game before. And it's really funny, and I'm gonna give you this disclaimer. Uh, some people love watching me play a game that I've never seen before because they're fascinated with how I learn and how quickly I adapt. And, and, and then sometimes people are just fascinated with how I react to the game. So like, um, uh, oh, I really like this, or oh, I don't like this. And so that initial reaction is just gold for them. And then some of you, I know it drives you nuts because you wish that I would just take the time to, to read the rules and play like three games of this myself before I move on and actually record it. Uh, let's be honest, come in Cheria, I played while I was learning. You saw me do two playthroughs of it. And by the end of the second one, I was done. And I moved on to the next one. <laughs> So if I did three playthroughs of Comancheria before I actually hit record, I, I'm already done with Comancheria. So, um, so it's it's a very interesting thing. Um, I like recording while I learn a game because that's when I have the most to say about it. If I've played a game three times and then I'm recording, it's not quite as fun. Now, 18OE was different, and uh, so was uh, like Crisis. Um, there's a few games I've shown you where I'm really good at the game and I understand the rules well. Um, it's funny because uh, Dinosaur Island's one that I know very well, but I ended up getting rules wrong while I did the recording of that one. Um, so I, I, that makes me laugh. So uh, anyways, my goal is to play this. And I'm sorry for I, I went off on a tangent there. Um, what I'm trying to do is determine how big of a game do we want to do for our first game. That's where I was going with my conversation. A six-player game, you know that, you know, if any of you watch me and, and my channel, this is where I'm clamoring. You know, I want to do the epic game. <laughs> that's where I want to go. I want to do this one. But, you know, that's controlling me and five NPCs. Like, how crazy of an undertaking is that? And maybe it's super crazy because it's my first game. I, I don't know any of that yet. So I got to figure that out before uh, I hit record again. So uh, here you go, you're introduced to this. I'm gonna get this uploaded. And yes, there will be a little bit of setup in video too uh, because I haven't picked my scenario yet. Um, but uh, for those of folks that skipped the video too because they just wanna see the playthrough, I'll try not to disappoint them with all my uh, diatribe like I have in this one. So anyways, uh, Ancient Civilizations of the Inner Sea, uh, it, it, it's, it looks neat. Um, I do have some concerns, but uh, I don't think I'm gonna hate the game. It's just, 
it's just it's very abstract and, and, and in some cases simple and um, uh, I am very impressed though with the way the designers have tried to make many scenarios to keep this game fresh. I think they knew that this was put discs on, take discs away. And so they give you a basic generic game to play, but I think they knew that that generic game would fall flat after a couple playthroughs. And so then they give you this huge scenario book. I mean, it's huge with all kinds of specific scenario and all kinds of rich flavor and rule variations inside of them to you know cater to that scenario. And um, I think that that is a level of love from a designer that knew what kind of game he was making. He knew where it might go. And so he you know, headed it off at the pass. He mitigated that by creating these scenarios, which to me required a hook of a lot more playtesting and a lot more work, right, to create these scenarios. So uh, I do appreciate it. Um, uh, for those of you that know me, I like these epic games and I prefer a campaign style game where I start off small and then I grow bigger. Um, this obviously is not gonna tickle that itch, um, but uh, nonetheless, I am looking forward to this and I hope some of you are as well. And uh, there are videos on YouTube, by the way. Uh, one guy did a the two player scenario here. Like he set up this exact scenario and he was actually quite quite comical. Um, he threw a lot of jokes in. He didn't do a bad job at all. I, I, I enjoyed his jokes and whatnot, but uh, he went fast, which I know uh, I never do. But uh, <laughs> um, anyways, uh, that was the thing and I thought he did fine. So we're gonna try it and if we do try it, I'm gonna try something bigger or maybe even one of these scenarios. I just haven't figured out yet. So, uh, if you're here for Civilizations of the Inner Sea, you can just shut it off now. I'm going to show another thing that arrived today, and that's Combat. Combat is also set up over there, and you can see I open it up and I'm looking at the components. I haven't punched any of the, the counters yet. Uh, I am hoping to get that to the table very soon. So, um, one thing is, uh, if we do a playthrough of this, and we are going to, um, you may not see me go through all the scenarios. I, I don't think I have the time. I already have another toy sitting on my table that I'm itching to play, and I got more toys coming in the mail. This game is suffering from the fact that I have all these other toys demanding my attention. Uh, but I think if, if I was in a lull and had this game on my table, there's a lot of activity here to keep me busy for many hours. Um, so that's the thing. And I hope I at least do it some justice through with a playthrough. I'm very curious how the um, AI is going to work in this game and whether it's going to be challenging and make sense. Uh, that's the thing I'm looking for the most. And um, uh, we're going to soon see. So anyways, 30 mi 38 minutes in. Uh, thank you for watching and stay awesome as always. Ancient Civilizations of the Inner Sea. Uh, I'm heading off to get some, some, some sleep. And then uh, I'll maybe crack at, take more crack at this tomorrow. And uh, like I said, I haven't read the solitaire rules yet, so I gotta get through that. And then once I feel comfortable, we'll get started with a scenario here. And uh, I'm hoping to wrap all this up within one or two days. So appreciate it, and we'll see you soon.